Uh, I'm very glad to be part of the first public lecture of religious studies in this new semester, January 2018. And we have a very, very exciting lecture and a very interesting lecturer for tonight, uh, Professor Christopher Larry, who came from the United States and he has been for a long time associated with Boston University. Uh, presently, he's a freelance writer, believe or not. Uh, but he is very well known for two monographs uh, which are related to a very important and interesting interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary topics. Before I get to that point, I would like to mention that he has been working basically all the time at the Religious Studies Department, and representing Religious Studies, but he's coming from the University of Chicago School, which uh, has not ever been a uh, an orthodox place for religious studies, uh, just the opposite. So he's carrying these stimuli with him. And his work has uh, been uh, distributed between interest in religion, in language, and not in the traditional way as language is connected with the Bible and religious studies, but in more postmodern ways, I would say. And also the question of music. Uh, in terms of magic, he wrote his PhD, which then became a very well-received monograph on Henrik Cornelius Agrippa, who was a 16th century, very curious German character, wandering around Europe, a humanist, dealing with all sorts of uh, murky things, and finally outputting the famous De Occulta Philosophia, or the Occult Philosophy, huge compendium of uh, encyclopedic knowledge about demonology, magic, natural magic, ritualistic magic. And Professor Larry examines this work and other works of Agrippa in the context of language use and with some very, very interesting uh, post-structuralist uh, concerns. And the second monograph widens this horizon to the magic mind. And uh, perhaps we can provoke him at the end with some questions about this book, The Magic Mind, what he means by that. But uh, today he's concentrating on his third interest, which is related to music. Is going to talk about the relationship between music and magic in some ways which I cannot anticipate, but we are going to witness it in a minute. So, Christopher, welcome in Budapest, welcome and see you, and the floor is yours. So, uh, is this on? Yeah, I just have to speak into it. Speak a bit. All right. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Gary. Let me thank you also for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is the first time I've visited to Budapest, uh, it's an extraordinary city, and um, it's also a lot warmer than at home, where it's currently hovering around minus 10 Celsius and we have a foot and a half of snow. So it's nice to be here. Um, a few minutes ago, you were listening to a piece of Beethoven's Gross Fugue, Opus 133, composed in 1825. This is the uh, uh, string quartet piece that you were hearing. Igor Stravinsky famously called the work an absolutely contemporary piece of music that will be contemporary forever. In 1826, however, a reviewer for the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung described the fugue as incomprehensible, like Chinese, and a confusion of Babel. Indeed, he felt that the concert was one that only the Moroccans might enjoy. Now, <laughs> I don't know whether those remarks mean all that much to you. Um, I realize this is cultured Europe, and uh, so consequently, I will assume, for the sake of argument, that many of you can, could hear the sort of radical, even destructive nature of Beethoven's last completed work. I suspect many are familiar with the broad trajectory of Western musical composition that continued to make the Grosse Fugue so shatteringly and enduringly important. Today I want to suggest that this work's reception points to an anomalous dimension of Western culture across a wide range of space and time, something that the late Jonathan Z. Smith called in a rather different context the uniquely unique. Now when I heard just a week ago that Smith had died on December 30th, I felt compelled to restructure this talk somewhat. His uh, contributions to scholarship on religion deserve a more thorough appreciation than I can give here. It's not my purpose to even attempt a proper preliminary, but some of you in religious studies may be surprised to learn that in much of Anglo-American scholarship, there's an ongoing move to deny Smith's work worth and even legitimacy. 
I'm not going to name names, obviously, but a few years back, we had several distinguished scholars deride Smith's famous dictum that there is no data for religion as obviously ridiculous and idiotic at a panel of the North American Association for the Study of Religion. Others have said that Smith spent his entire career stating the obvious. So I thought it might be worthwhile to remind ourselves just why J.C. Smith still matters. In his article, Fences and Neighbors from Imagining Religion, Smith described the patterns of comparative scholarship with regard to the category religion as illogical and incoherent, a screen occluding an underlying apologetics. In short, when one compares any two objects, one asserts that while both are, of course, unique, they nevertheless possess qualities, or there are qualities that can be attributed to or predicated of them by the comparatist, that render them comparable in formal terms. But scholars of religion traditionally claim that religion was not susceptible to this analytical device. Unlike other objects, religion cannot be compared to anything else. As Smith notes, this makes religion uniquely unique. To quote him, some special uniqueness is claimed for religion as well as for particular religious traditions, and this uniqueness is conceived to be unilateral and non-reciprocal. If religion is unique with respect to cultural activities, it is rarely conceded that therefore these activities are unique with respect to religion. Properly speaking, uniqueness is an ordinary presupposition of definition and classification. It is not some odd point of pride. To begin then, I've already noted that in some ways, Beethoven's Grosse Fuga was often seen, has often been seen, as uniquely unique. And furthermore, that this supposed quality, initially marked as little more than alienness and incomprehensibility, came in the 20th century to indicate the work's radical superiority and overwhelming importance. Its uniqueness is indeed an odd point of pride. Now that's not to say, of course, that the Grosse Fuga is a religious work. What Smith's discussion reveals is that the discourses surrounding religion tend to denote it in particular remarkable ways. I'm suggesting only that this same pattern has often been used in elite Western discourses to mark musical works, in fact, to mark music itself. And in what follows, I wanted to make some preliminary forays into why and how that pattern emerged, as well as what it reveals with reference to our ongoing deconstruction, and I mean that in Derrida's sense, of religion. In the classical world, the archetype of music, its radical uniqueness and its rejection, is Orpheus, one of the earliest attested Greek mythological figures and one of the most peculiar. Orpheus' story has six significant episodes attested with greatly varying frequency, which I will survey quickly. Orpheus was usually the son of Oeagrus, perhaps a minor river god or the king of Thrace, or both, and the muse Calliope. Little more about his early life is extant, although some accounts suggest that he received the power of song directly from Apollo, sometimes by theft. Aboard Jason's ship Argo, Orpheus called the stroke, beating time and singing. This first attested element, although seemingly the dominant early conception, does not recur often in later materials, although Apollodorus tells us that as they sailed past the sirens, Orpheus restrained the Argonauts by chanting a counter melody. Of principal interest in the 5th century was the power of Orpheus's music. He played some sort of lyre or kithara, the iconographic evidence is unstable, and with its music and his song commanded st stones and trees to move and bow down. The well-known underworld descent is principally a Roman and later fascination of secondary interest to the Greeks. Greek fragments suggest that he did not always fail to rescue a wife whose name was not always Eurydice. <coughs> Fifth and fourth century texts do give considerable attention to Orpheus's death and dismemberment at the hands of the women of Thrace. While it seems that his head washed up on the shores of Lesbos and continued to prophesy and sing, possibly serving as a masculine muse to the sapphic poets, we have little material on the point, which seems to have been largely a matter of local cultic concern. Iconographically, Orpheus is remarkable in that he never carries a weapon, only a lyre or similar stringed instrument and he almost invariably wears clothing or headgear marking him as Thracian. This constant foreignness, coupled with his undoubted antiquity, has led some to speculate that Orpheus began as a Minoan shaman. By this reading, his beating of drums aboard the Argo guided a journey past the pillars of death. If so, the underworld rescue would be his second or third trip, and he would also foreshadow Odysseus' search among the shades. Plato is remarkably venomous about Orpheus, in part, Plato's comments respond to the much-contested Orphic cults. 
They produce a bushel of books of Musaeus and Orpheus, the offspring of the moon and of the muses, as they affirm. And these books they use in their ritual and make not only ordinary men but states believe that there really are remissions of sins and purifications for deeds of injustice by means of sacrifice and pleasant sport for the living, and that there are also special rites for the defunct that deliver us from evils in that other world, while terrible things await those who have neglected to sacrifice. Plato again connects Orpheus and Musaeus with mystic rites and soothsayings in Protagoras, but it's in the symposium that Orpheus himself comes in for the harshest condemnation. In this manner, even the gods give special honor to zeal and courage in concerns of love. But Orpheus, son of Oiagoras, they sent back with failure from Hades, showing him only a wraith of the woman for whom he came. Her real self they would not bestow, for he was accounted to have gone upon a coward's quest, too like the minstrel that he was, and to have lacked the spirit to die as Alcestis did for sake of love, when he contrived the means of entering Hades alive. Wherefore they laid upon him the penalty he deserved and caused him to meet his death at the hands of women. This denunciation should attract our attention not least because of the platonic concern with poetry and rhetoric. We encounter here a series of binary oppositions, which one need not be entirely an old-fashioned structuralist to recognize. Male-female, reason emotion, brave cowardly, strong weak, argument prophecy, men gods. Before positioning Orpheus further, consider the platonic denunciation of Gorgias's rhetoric. Gorgias' defense of Helen emphasizes non-rational poetic devices to sway audiences, where Plato attacks all such devices. This opposition partly overlaps with that between mythos and logos, as Bruce Lincoln and others have shown. But Lincoln's subtle examination reveals a remarkable reversal. In Homeric epic, mythos is masculine, powerful, and veridically true, speech that bodies forth divine authority. Against this, logos is feminine, weak, and deceptive, seducing men away from the battlefield with winning words and beguiling song. In Plato, however, all of this is reversed. Now, logos is male, rational, and true, or at least its truth content can be evaluated and not merely asserted. Mythos, by contrast, has become old wives' tales, feminine, irrational, and potentially dangerous. Small wonder that Socrates veils his head in shame before speaking of mythos in the Phaedrus. Now, as Derrida persuasively argued, the Platonic Logos already manifests that distinctive nostalgia that he calls logocentrism, the insistence on a longing after presence, particularly in language. In terms of religion, we note in the Mythos Logos inversion that Plato elevates presence in the same gesture as he rejects it, or rather, he emphasizes human presence at the expense of the divine. Truth is to be found in the co-presence of male dialogue. Divine presence is now excluded from the proper modalities of truth because it is irrational and therefore feminine. The Platonic rejection of mythos and divine presence thus engenders a double gesture. On the one hand, men must seek truth and presence in logos, in rational discourse among men. On the other, such discourse must be constantly supplemented and protected. Since rational logos does not carry presence, as the mythos, Male discourse requires continual reaffirmations of its truth and certainty, and it must at all costs be segregated from that most dangerous mode of expression, mythos, against which logos cannot be compared without exposure. In Robert Gell's account, Gorgias uses poetic devices versus plain speech, plays on emotion versus reason, and thus elevates weak arguments over strong. Following Lincoln's analysis, we might go further and say that in doing so, Gorgias has, in Plato's view, put the feminine ahead of the masculine, as witness also the subject of his defense, i.e. Helen. At this point, however, the problem of Orpheus returns. Orpheus, whatever Plato may have said, was male, brave, one has to give him some credit for uh, traveling into the underworld twice and returning alive, a feat I do not recall repeated elsewhere, and commonly affiliated with Apollo. Indeed, some readings would have the women of Thrace manifestations of Dionysus' Menads. We may be missing some crucial fragments of the story to clarify what Plato meant in calling Orpheus a coward, but regardless, there's something fundamentally peculiar here. Why should Plato denounce Orpheus, Musaeus, and indeed music, and in the same terms amplified to near hysteria, used to condemn rhetoric and poetic devices? Consider Orpheus's death. 
There are several brief accounts and a number of artistic representations of the scene, but relatively little consistency beyond the blunt facts. The women of Thrace murdered Orpheus with sticks and stones and then tore his body to bits. Why? This is not clear. But in the dominant accounts, Orpheus was, or the women thought he was, leading the Thracian men astray in some fashion. Some have supposed, of course, that the straying in question was sexual, relying on the rather isolated testimony of Phanocles and the Roman Ovid. But at least for Plato, this would hardly be grounds for absolute denunciation. <clears throat> Regardless, the story leaves Orpheus in a strange position vis-a-vis -vis Plato. Here we have a man of extraordinary gifts, mild-mannered, pacifistic, who in some unspecified fashion leads the local men astray, prompting more conservative and irrational elements to murderous assault. Is this the story of Orpheus or of Socrates? Thus Plato's problem. On the one hand, the platonic semiotic ideology lends itself to a neat, consistent system of oppositions. Good speech as opposed to bad by its reliance on human male reason and its rejection of both external divine authority claims and merely poetic devices that play on emotion. Indeed, these are conflated in the image of the old wives' tale of Ouro Gorgias. Perhaps once heroes spoke mythos inspired by the gods, but today truth and courage are marked by speaking truly, honestly, and rationally, by examining carefully and openly all claims laid before the thinking man. In this ideal picture, however, a few irritants do crop up and cannot fully be suppressed. As we know from Derrida, there's the problem of writing, which uses exteriority and physical solidity to give a false appearance of truth. This is the pharmacon for memory discussed in Phaedrus. Orpheus is exactly the reverse. Music has power to sway men's spirits, as Socrates admits, yet it does not succumb to a fully rational account. To conclude this mythic opening by returning to the Homeric problem of mythos and logos. In the Iliad, Patroclus pauses to heal Eurypylus's arrow wound. In a remarkable scene, a kind of lull in the storm of battle, Patroclus bathes the wound, draws the arrow, applies subtle medicines, heals his friend's body, and sings. Eterpe, to delight, cheer, and gladden. The verb is strongly affiliated with euterpe, the muse of music and delight. And this singing, although music, as it were, is marked explicitly as logos. Patroclus sat in the hut of kindly Eurypylus. He entertained eterpe, him with logoi, and on his baleful wound he sprinkled drugs, pharmacae, to cure the dark pains. Patroclus steps out of the manly theater of war and mythos into the womanly world of peace and logos. Here we see music's healing power, its function as pharmacon, and we see, too, the poison that it represents for Plato. <clears throat> so with Orpheus, we have a beautifully clear example of the ascription of radical otherness to an object. This is the process by which, in Durkheim's terms, objects or categories or behaviors become sacred. In Kathy Bell's terminology, this is the process of ritualization, although I think it's simpler to call it sacralization. In essence, the object is marked as radically other, boundaries and prescriptions are erected around it, and the thing is removed from rational discourse, for good and for ill. For people like myself and Mr. Putnik, this process is most familiar in reference to the category of magic. Jonathan Smith once noted that in early modern and later Western discourse, magic is doubly other the opposite of both religion and science. And while in scholarship on magic as category, this has usually been perceived as a negative, magic is other, foreign, disliked, irrational, and so on, it also, of course, grants and assumes power. The Orpheus material just reviewed demonstrates that, at least for some Greek elites, music had a similar position. While further examination of this complex in Greek material would be interesting, and with the colossal synthetic work of Thomas Matheson, a project that could certainly be attempted profitably, I want to move forward to start. To follow up Smith's dicta concerning comparison, what we've just established here is a basis for formal comparison of the terms magic, music, and religion, and, although I won't follow this line here, of science. Simply, we found a cluster of extremely similar formal qualities in all three objects, and this allows comparison. Two important caveats. <clears throat> First, similarity is not identity. To say that two objects are comparable is not to say that they are good. Second, a formal similarity is not an ontological or a causal one. That Plato positioned Orpheus's music in a similar manner to that which many scholars early last century ascribed to magic does not mean that the two really have anything in common intrinsically, 
nor that Fraser, for example, interpreted magic as he did because he thought it similar to music. I insist on these obvious caveats because in the contemporary scholarly climate, at least in the United States, comparison has become exclusively a function of historical causality. Comparative history, so-called, is in fact contact history. To compare historical phenomena of classical Greece and, let's say, medieval Japan would be held to be intrinsically bad method. The only legitimate use for comparison in history would be something like early modern European and Chinese intellectual formations as studied in the instance of Matteo Ricci's mission. <coughs> this low-level disdain evinced by professional historians reaches a hysterical pitch in religious studies, where comparison of any kind is often considered intrinsically a means of smuggling Protestant apologetic triumphalism into scholarship. Thus, contra Smith's point throughout much of imagining religion, Judaism in particular is uniquely unique, not comparable to anything anywhere, and those who claim otherwise are Protestant anti-Semites. Now, I shall take it for granted that such typically American right-wing radical exceptionalism may here be dismissed with the scorn it hardly deserves. One does wonder in passing whether some of the recent desire to set aside Smith's work is not a function of the ongoing procedure in the U.S. Academy of transmuting Judaism into the discipline's new Protestant norm, but this is a digression. The interesting part about the potential formal comparison delineated here, that among magic, religion, and music, is not really that one could go a great deal further in enumerating the similarities. It is rather that the history of all three categories undergoes a dramatic transformation in the extended early modern period a transformation that in all cases will establish a new doxic understanding. That is, after the early modern period, magic, religion, and music will have new characteristics and qualities that are assumed almost without exception to be obvious and innate, so much so that the most powerful and long-standing trajectories of scholarly discourse challenging them will have almost no impact, not only on broader public discourse, but indeed on the very scholarly disciplines most closely concerned. <laughs> now, some of us here, like Mr. Putnik, Mr. Sunmi, and myself, know this story all too well with reference to magic. Probably most of us involved with religious studies know it for religion. One has only to note how little Durkheim's scintillating challenge has actually altered how scholars in religious studies or history actually think. But I suggest the specifically musical variant is less known. In short, then, I want to briefly survey the categorical formation that came to be known as absolute music. Absolute music is a phrase with a peculiar history. It was coined by Richard Wagner in an 1846 essay on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He used it as a term of opprobrium. Wagner accused his contemporary music critics and aestheticians of distorting and even undermining music by their insistence on non-diegetic, non-textual instrumental music, music with no ostensible programmatic content. This formulation received its most influential rebuttal in Edward Hanslick's 1854 book, The Musicale Schöne, which defended the absolute character of music on philosophical grounds. If on the one hand it's surprising that it took so long to come up with a name for this category, it's more surprising, and I think more interesting, just how young this thing actually was. Already among the pre-Socratics, the principal philosophical concern, problem occasioned by music, was its power. Music appears to do things to people and even things. Witness Orpheus, most importantly, but also Amphion, Arion, and Timotheus. Yet while the Greek category of musike included all arts over which the muses presided, and thus several forms of poetry, the Greeks insisted that the power of music in our sense, artistically crafted sound, was distinct from any word sung. Orpheus' performance in the underworld is emblematic. Several sources note that Hades was actually unable to understand the words. Now, Plato was neither the first nor the last to express reservations about music's power. A striking example comes from Augustine's Confessions. I am aware that our minds are moved in a more spiritual and passionate way by these actual holy words when they are sung than if they were not sung. Also, all the emotions of our spirit, in accordance with their various types, have their own particular vocal and singing modes that are stimulated by a kind of mysterious kinship 
but the sensual pleasure that affects me physically often leads me astray, as when sense perception does not accompany reason in such a way as to be content with second place, but tries to get to the front and take the lead. In such cases, therefore, I sin without realizing. To explain this mysterious non-rational power, most thinkers prior to about 1500 pointed to Pythagorean too. In short, Pythagoras supposedly worked out that pitches precisely tuned to one another resonate at frequencies whose ratios are simple integers. An octave is two to one, a fifth three to two, a fourth four to three. This suggested that pitch relations, which is to say tuning, reflects fundamental principles of the cosmos itself. This is the harmony of the spheres. Music affects the human spirit or soul, therefore, because of a harmonic isomorphism, variously defined and explained. Simply, the soul and the cosmos are in tune, which reveals aspects of the creation. This is why music was assigned to the medieval quadrivium, along with arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, rather than to the less important trivium of human sciences. Within music, too, we find a hierarchy which extends in good Dionysian Neoplatonic fashion from the intellectual to the rational to the sensual. Most influential here is Boethius's De Institutione Musica, which classifies thus, Musica Mundana, the harmony of the spheres, imperceptible to humankind, Musica Humana, the harmony of the human soul, perceptible within the mind of the individual, and Musica Instrumentalis, sounding music, perceptible to the sensual. Significantly, at the bottom of the Boethian schema was almost everything that we would now call music. And throughout the Middle Ages, musica instrumentalis, or practica, was unimportant intellectual. In the early modern period, however, everything changes. Beginning in the early 16th century, musica practica starts its rise to dominance. In essence, the question is how to relate reason to the senses in reference to music. This is the same problem as before, the power of music. But now it's a matter of harnessing music's power to rationally control rhetoric. Giuseppe Zarlino's Istituzioni Armoniche of 1558 puts the point very clearly. Although harmony on its own possesses a certain power to dispose the spirit and to make it happy or sad, and although its power can double itself through rhythm, these two elements together are nevertheless insufficient to generate any extrinsic passions in any subject. Such power is achieved, however, through the oration which expresses a variety of departments. <coughs> Excuse me. To quote Mark Evan Bonds, Zarlino defines music in terms of the Aristotelian categories of cause, material, sound, formal, number, and final, to change the feeling and to induce in us diverse passions. He distinguishes between definition and description and criticizes those who confuse music's essential and accidental features. Mathematics applies solely to the formal cause of music, not to its purpose. This marks a significant shift in thinking, one taken up by most subsequent theorists. Mathematics remains an element of music, but music's closest companion would now be rhetoric, one of the arts of the trivium. In theory, <coughs> music remained within the quadrivium as an art of number. In practice, it would be treated more and more as an art of language, and more specifically still as an art of persuasion, which is to say, as an art of rhetoric. Now this conception, which dominates until the late 18th century, is explicitly a theory of mimesis. At base, music is effective insofar as it imitates the movement of the passions, but because music is held to be inarticulate, such imitation can only function when allied to the articulate power of language. This way of thinking culminates with the new notion of the fine arts. Charles Bateau, in his 1746, uh, The Fine Arts Reduced to a Single Principle, pointed to mimesis as that single principle on which all fine arts necessarily rest. Every work of art had to imitate or represent an object drawn from nature. The artist was obliged to give this object a stylized form, but every poem or painting or piece of sculpture had to represent something <coughs> tangible, be it a person, a historical event, or a scene in nature. This principle could be applied easily to vocal music, whose object of representation could be located in the text being sung. Indeed, 18th century theorists and composers generally agreed that specific varieties of music could have particular emotional effects on listeners through mimesis. And this led to a series of approaches that 20th century scholars somewhat inaccurately labeled the affectin era, or doctrine of affects. The problem, obviously, was instrumental music, which in the Baroque period began to gain ground as an important artistic mode. 
The consensus that emerged over the course of the 18th century was that human passions were what instrumental music could represent or imitate best, love, anger, tenderness, and so on. Critics also recognized a secondary kind of imitation in certain sounds of nature that could be transferred to an instrument or ensembles, such as bird calls or waterfalls. But commentators invariably considered this literalistic sort of imitation to be of a lesser kind. Human passions, on the other hand, could be imitated and represented in music. This mimetic theory led to what we call program music, instrumental works with an explicit non-musical object of representation, such as Vivaldi's Seasons. Now, such an approach couldn't last, not with the rapid social changes in late 18th century Europe, and particularly the expansion of the middle class and its growing demand for music, especially instrumental music. With the great classical composers, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, instrumental non-programmatic music came to dominate and Zarlino's mimetic theory collapsed. From about 1770, give or take, we see a new conception. It's especially important in the Germanic lands, but we see it also in Rousseau, who had already begun to question the subordinate position of music as a handmaiden to rhetoric 25 years earlier. The uncertainty regarding instrumental music is famously summed up in Rousseau's anecdote from the Dictionnaire de Musique. To understand what all the gallimaufry of sonatas by which one is overwhelmed might want to say, we would have to follow the lead of the crude artist who must write underneath his drawings, this is a tree, this is a man, this is a horse. I shall never forget the witticism of the celebrated Fontenelle, who found himself worn out by these ceaseless symphonies and in a transport of impatience cried out loudly, Sonata, what do you want of me? By contrast, the encyclopedist d'Alembert remarked, all this purely instrumental music, without purpose and without aim, speaks to neither the mind nor the soul, and deserves the question posed to it by Fontenelle, Sonate que me veux -tu? Composers who write instrumental music will produce nothing but trifling noise, unless they have in mind to paint an event or an expression of feeling, as in the case of the celebrated Tartini. D'Alembert thinks instrumental music can only be justified when given a program, but Rousseau is hinting the reverse. For him, music speaks, but only its own language, which cannot be translated into any other. Rousseau gently lampoons Fontenelle for demanding an unmusical meaning, rather than seeking to understand the music's own meaning. This will be the crux of the transformation. In the century from Rousseau's early work to Wagner's essay, music will move from the lowest to the highest of the arts. Where it had been inarticulate, it now becomes pure. Where it had needed a text to express anything, it now transcends language. This is the creation of absolute music. Now, there are many, many issues here. I want to emphasize a few, specifically form, autonomy, and disclosiveness. At base, form here was long understood to mediate between essence and effect. In most cases, form was referred to one or another version of Pythagorean number theory, as with Kepner or Leibniz. But the decline of hard-edged Pythagoreanism, coupled to growing concern for musical expression, led to a sharp distinction between form and content. An excellent example here is Schiller, who writes that although the content of emotions cannot be represented in art, the form certainly can be. Indeed, one art is universally beloved and powerful that has no other object than the form of these emotions. This art is music. Similarly, Goethe remarks that the dignity of art appears most eminently in music because it has no material that would have to be taken into account. It is entirely form and substance and elevates, elevates and ennobles everything it expresses. This conception leads to an insistence on autonomy. Because music is formal, it is autonomous with respect to other arts. An interesting example is Herder, who in the 1800 Caligone said that the slow course of music's history demonstrates how difficult it has been for music to separate herself from word and gesture, her sisters, and develop as an art in her own right. Music must have its own freedom to speak for itself alone, for it has developed itself into an art of its own kind without words, through itself, and in itself. This autonomy of music links to that of the artist. As a result, mimesis loses much of its appeal in all of the arts, supplementing or supplanted by ideas of genius, originality, self-expression. Lessing, Goethe, Goethe, Herder, and others continue to acknowledge nature as a point of reference, but the emphasis now shifts to imitating the process rather than the products of creation. The earliest form of poetry, as Herder argued, was 
man's act of naming things in relation to himself, as related in the book of Genesis. The poet functions as an imitator of the Godhead, a second creator. Thus, the formal and autonomous nature of music leads to its disclosiveness, its power to reveal something beyond mimesis. Schlegel argues that language cannot convey the fullness of human emotion and subjectivity and therefore requires a supplement. The Dravidian logic of the supplement is at work here. For this reason, music stands high above art in general, for feeling and will often go far beyond thought. Music as inspiration, as the language of feeling, which agitates consciousness at its source, is the only universal language and the only ideal for any language that would justify itself by acting upon the innermost heart of consciousness. To be sure, feeling does not take precedence as the ruler of consciousness, though in terms of priority and origin, it does. Schelling, in his 1800 system of transcendental idealism, argues that art opens, as it were, the holiest of holies. When a great painting comes into being, it is as though the invisible curtain that separates the real from the ideal world is raised. And a few years later, he's turning to a Pythagorean theory. Rhythm, harmony, and melody are the first and purest forms of motion in the universe. The forms of music are the forms of eternal things, insofar as they can be considered from the perspective of the material world, and music is nothing other than the perceived rhythm and harmony of the visible universe itself. By 1846, when Wagner coins the neologism absolute music, not only has the thing existed for some 70 odd years, but it has had an elaborate theoretical and philosophical edifice erected around it. The term spreads rapidly until by about 1860 or so, its Wagnerian polemical roots have been largely forgotten. Absolute music has become an obvious given. Now, this history has been abstract, notions and ideas referring vaguely to music. But I said some time ago that what the Greeks meant by musike isn't much like what we mean by music. Just as Boethius relegated actual sound in music to the bottommost rung of his hierarchy. <clears throat> so it's important to consider what all these philosophers and aestheticians were actually referring to. As Rousseau's anecdote suggests, the place to focus is the sonata. I will try to be brief. Originally, <coughs> sonata referred to a broad style or genre, but to make an exceedingly complicated story short, in the classical era around the late 18th century, sonata came to mean a mode of composition quite different to anything before. At the time, it was probably thought of as a form or style, but with hindsight, we realize that the most important examples, we're talking about hundreds of compositions here, are wildly disparate in terms of what form generally means and has meant in music theory. Many music scholars now refer to sonata as a principle, as a constellation of ideals and methods tending to produce compositions with a definite family resemblance. Stripping down to bare bones and ignoring a number of significant complexities, we can say that a sonata goes exposition, development, recapitulation. In the exposition, a first theme appears, establishing a tonic or home key. A rapid transition moves to a second theme in a new key, usually the dominant, a fifth above the home key, if the home key is major, or the relative major, a minor third above the home key, if the home is minor. That is to say, if we start in C major, we'll move to G major, if in C minor, to E flat major. This second theme is briefly elaborated, establishing a new possible home key. Commonly, this exposition is repeated. We have now set up a problem. In short, which key are we in? The two themes are related. They echo and contrast one another in various possible ways, but at base, the relationship depends on a single pitch. <laughs> to be slightly technical, the difference between a major key and its dominant lies at the subdominant fourth of the major key and the leading tone seventh of the dominant. In C major, the subdominant is F. In the dominant G major, the leading tone is F sharp. Uh, in, in the two keys, <clears throat> only these two pitches differ. F can never appear in G major except as a passing dissonance, nor can F sharp appear in C major. Furthermore, an F sharp in G major, because it's the leading tone, must be resolved upward to G. That's a long-standing rule. If we're unsure whether we're in C or G major, all we have to do is listen for F sharp. If it doesn't appear, we're in C. If it appears but is not resolved up to G, we're in C. If it appears strongly and is always resolved up to G, we're in G. So the linchpin of the difference is this one pitch. The same point holds for relative minor and major keys. They share a common pitch collection, but the minor necessitates differential handling. And set in some, in short, it boils down to the same F and F sharp. Now, in the development, the work moves rapidly through a number of keys, exploring the material established in the exposition. 
This exploratory process, short or long, culminates with an assertion of the original tonic or home key through a retransition commonly built on a prolonged dominant seventh, which is to say an extended dominant chord that must resolve to the tonic. The recapitulation begins like the exposition with a statement of the first theme in its home key, but now the transition to the second theme keeps it in the first theme's home key. This resolves the problem. We know which is the controlling key, and commonly we conclude with a code. Setting aside technical details, this sonotic principle asserts a logical structure that refers musical elements to one another. If it sounds anything like dialectics, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, that's correct and not coincidental. The sonata principle constructs a logical argument about musical material worked out and resolved in purely musical terms. With the sonata principle, we see clearly how form and autonomy manifest within the music. The only bits that refer to anything external are the seemingly arbitrary voice leading rules. But these rules are in fact best understood mathematically. They are not arbitrary rules imposed by cultural habit. As two generations of music theorists in the late 20th century have shown, you can actually see these relationships as elegant mathematical workings out of the implications of the harmonic overtone series on the diatonic scale. The only external reference are one, high things tend to fall, two, the elementary prerequisite of the diatonic scale in the dodecaphonic pitch collection. Once this sonata principle enters the compositional vocabulary of the classicists, it is retained almost without challenge straight through to radicals like Debussy. And the notion of structuring a work to be controlled by an internal self-determined logic not only passed through that challenge, but was taken to its extreme with 20th century developments like integral serials. In short, the sonata principle very rapidly took on the character of the sacred in Durkheim's sense. It was doxic, a principle so unquestionable that works which did not obey it were seen as bad music or indeed not music at all. In Durkheim's preferred terminology, violation was seen as profanation and immediately extended. It was not the sonata that was profane, but music. Conversely, an especially brilliant handling of the demands of the sonata was ipso facto superlative music. And while Wagner actually obeyed such principles in many ways throughout his work, it was in part this elision, good or bad sonata means good or bad music, that drove his attack on absolute music. Because his operas, like all operas, necessarily had to balance such abstract demands against other kinds of dramatic factors, opera in general was held to be a lesser musical form, incapable of the highest achievement. Edward Hanslick, if any ways the anti-Wagner, takes the sonata principle as axiomatic. The illusion is complete. <laughs> Given that the sonata principle is the ultimate expression of the abstract truths of what music really is in its essence, therefore, all music can be evaluated on the basis of adherence. In the same way, a totem, in Durkheim's understanding, is sacred because it represents both the society and the god, and thus the society is the god. This analogy is not overstretched. For Hanslick, the best exemplars actually achieve transcendence and can draw listeners into experience of the transcendent. Now, for Durkheim, of course, the sacred mediates society, which brings us to Wagner's objection. When I spoke about autonomy before, I emphasized autonomy of music as an art form unto itself and the concomitant autonomy of the artist, here the composer as second creator. But Wagner coined the term absolute music as a criticism in an essay on Beethoven's Ninth Sym Symphony. Yet Wagner adored Beethoven, who was lionized in his own day and thereafter as a Promethean genius who stole musical fire from the heavens and did so in the ultimate expression of the sonata form, the late classical <coughs> symphony. How could Wagner find anything to criticize here? As soon as Beethoven had written his last symphony, Wagner wrote, every musical guild could patch and stuff as much as it liked in its effort to create a man of absolute music. But it was just this and nothing more, a patched and stuffed imaginary man. No sensate natural man could emerge from such a workshop any longer. After Haydn and Mozart, a Beethoven could and had to appear. The spirit of music necessarily demanded him, and without waiting, there he was. Who would now be to Beethoven what Beethoven was to Haydn and Mozart in the realm of absolute music? The greatest genius could do nothing more here, precisely because the spirit of absolute music no longer has needed him. The finale of the Ninth Symphony, he says, spells the death of absolute music. 
He puts it in rather purple prose, of course. With this beginning of the finale of the fourth movement, uh, Beethoven's music takes on a decidedly more speaking character. It abandons the character of pure instrumental music to which it had adhered in the first three movements. This seems like the final attempt to express through instrumental music alone a secure, well-defined, and unalloyed sense of joy. This intractable medium, instrumental music, however, appears inadequate to sustain such limitation. Like the raging sea, it foams up, sinks back down again, and the wild, chaotic scream of unsatiated passion assaults our ears more strongly than before. At this point, a human voice confronts the rage of the instruments with the clear and confident expression of speech. He's referring, of course, to the ode to joy. But if Beethoven thus uh, shattered absolute music, the aestheticians and philosophers, in Wagner's judgment, ignored or simply did not understand his achievement. Aesthetics then becomes, as he puts it, a truly art-murderous activity, driven to dogmatic cruelty, but that it seeks to sacrifice with reactionary zeal the reality of the natural disposition toward new works of art on the altar of the conservative phantasm of an absolute artwork, which can never be realized for the simple reason that its realization already lies far behind us in the past. Mark Bonds has summarized Wagner's not entirely consistent arguments as follows. Absolute music has to do with the function of a work. Whether that work is vocal or instrumental is beside the point. Wagner's neologism originates not as a designation for a particular repertory of music, but for any kind of music, instrumental or vocal, that was socially disengaged and existed merely for its own sake. Wagner called works of this kind unfrei, on the grounds that they were consigned to a sort of aesthetic solitary confinement. So, in short, it is absolute music's claim to social and political autonomy that drives Wagner to fury. To achieve a view of absolute music that will satisfy both sides will require ever greater emphasis on mediation over mimesis. The question is what the, such absolute music could mediate. And in Schopenhauer, we get the answer. Music does not for him, represent the will mimetically, but discloses the will itself. We could just as well call the world embodied music as embodied will, he says. This is the reason music makes every picture, indeed every scene from real life and from the world, at once appear in enhanced significance. For Schopenhauer, the real world of particular things consists of universalia in re, and concepts are universalia post rem, but music presents universalia ante rem, the innermost kernel preceding the shaping of all form. The effect of music is more powerful and penetrating than that of the other arts, for these others speak only of the shadow, but music of the essence. Both directly and indirectly, Schopenhauer's approach works to dissolve the basis of the polemics between Wagnerians and partisans of a Hanslick usually called Weine Tonkunst, pure tone art. In effect, Schopenhauer dissociates absolute music from any particular repertory. The Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk could be as absolute as any work of Brahms. Within Schopenhauer's framework, music is necessarily embedded in the phenomenal, yet it transcends. It requires no mediation in the form of language or concept, and yet it can absorb such mediation. Music stands above everything else in that it comprehends, but is not dependent on the mimetic. To sum up, let me just list off the central elements of absolute music that I've run through rather densely. Purity, the absolute, transcendence, Autonomy, disclosure, ineffability, the inexpressible, cosmic mystery, and individual as opposed to social function and response. In a nutshell, the conception of absolute music in the 19th century and beyond exactly parallels the imagination of religion in the same period. Now, supposing that's true, what then? In several of his works, notably the core volume Mythologie, Claude Lévi-Strauss claimed that the mythological, as a mode of thought, vanished from Europe in the late Middle Ages and was taken up in a new medium, i.e. music. I say he claimed this because he didn't bother to make an argument. Probably a good thing, his understanding of music theory and history was sufficiently peculiar that if he had tried it, it would likely have gone all right. That said, I do think Lévi-Strauss was on to something. I don't entirely believe in a mythic function in his sense. But if we consider a semiotic modality that operates structurally that rather than rhetorically, it does appear to have taken a central position in music around the time it suggests. 
That said, Lady Struss pointed to quite the wrong sort of music to make the case. In the brief discussion today, I've tried to argue that the phenomenon known as absolute music is the place to look. I argue that the semiotics of absolute music sheds important light on the European invention and transformation of religion, and particularly the rather paradoxical rise of mediation within the immediacy of transcendence in the West. This is also to suggest that the seemingly endless litany of 19th and early 20th century thinkers who perceived in music a mode of immediate access to the divine who in fact developed a range of comparisons between absolute music and religion, laid crucial groundwork for future scholarship on the categorical problems attendant on religion. But such comparisons faded away over the course of the last century, precisely and not coincidentally, as religious studies and musicology became firmly established in the modern academy. Indeed, the refusal to accept and examine the historically undeniable connections and correlations between the two categories amounts to an apologetic, defensive gesture that seeks to demonstrate through omission the non-apologetic, objective character of the scholarship in question. That is to say, I think that scholars of religion do not take musical data seriously because such data clearly demonstrates the ideological principles of the discipline, principles that the current ritualized attacks on Protestant triumphalism and citations of J.C. Smith do nothing to alter. If we actually want to understand how and why Religion got invented and stabilized in the forms we've come to recognize and to grasp fully the nature and function of mediation in that history, we can no longer ignore the musical literature of the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic periods. This will require not only the history of ideas approach I've taken here, but also serious engagement with the music itself. There's a considerable body of semiotic and semiological work on music, for example, but like most music scholarship, it has remained largely outside of the normative scholarly discourses of the humanities. This cannot continue. Interestingly, this exclusion of music scholarship parallels not only that of music as data, but also that of religion scholarship, in precisely the same way as religious studies has signally failed to penetrate the wider reaches of humanistic scholarship, so too with music, and for some, for many of the same self-defeating reasons. Even in scholarship that most thoroughly rejects the Protestant foundations of the discipline, the difficulty remains. Recent work has examined in detail the semiotic transformations implicit in and extending from Protestant anti-ritualism, the complaints against vain repetitions, words in a sense meaningless and claimed to be only formally operative. Granted this, it is surely remarkable that the rise of absolute music a century later celebrated its transcendence, its power to mediate the divine, precisely insofar as it is meaningless, does not have a rhetorical, descriptive, or referential for instance, Schopenhauer valued music's disclosive capacities above those of any other art, not in spite of its, its non-conceptual nature, but because of it. Pure instrumental music is elevated to supremacy because it functions but has no meaning. If Levi-Strauss thought music took over a mythic function, perhaps we should ask if it took over a ritual function. In my view, there can be little question that a new semiotic ideology develops from the early 16th to the late 18th century. <coughs> Both religion and music manifest it and a great deal of labor has been devoted to understanding the two, but only separately from one another. Yet these spheres turn out to <laughs> resonate together, and we ought to ask about the ideologies that imagine them as distinct. From the Greeks to the 19th century Romantic philosophers, the connection of music to the divine has been universally claimed, studied, analyzed, and debated. In the literature of absolute music, deep correlations become undeniable. Why do we pretend that religion and music are not allied? I find it telling and disturbing that it is only within the late, with the late 19th century creation of academic <coughs> scholarship on religion and on music that this link disappears. Quite suddenly, we stop our ears and shut out literally millennia of data. What are we afraid we might hear? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.